Hey everybody, uh, I'm about to get started. Uh, I'm still putting a few things together, but I think I'm at a place that's uh, good enough to kind of kind of get started on the beauty render stuff. Uh, one sec. I'm just testing the audio real quick. Um, I'm listening on the stream before I mute. All right, happy Saturday, everybody, and happy beginning of spring break. I guess today is sort of the official start of that. Um, hopefully a few of you can still make it today. If not, you know, I'll be recording this as usual, so this will be up and available for you all week. Um, <clears throat> so today I just wanted to focus on basically just creating a beauty render. Um, I don't think this has been part of the curriculum in the past necessarily, but I felt like uh, kind of going through how to actually showcase your models uh, would be advantageous. Uh, even though we're not necessarily quite there yet with our own models, uh, you can see the one in front right now. I started setting up a marmoset render for her. Uh, she's getting pretty close, but there's definitely uh, a decent amount of texture work that I still need to do. Um, keep in mind, I'm taking her a <clears throat> probably a little bit further than most of you guys are going to be taking yours, um, just because this is a personal portfolio project that I'm working on, so I'm really going to take the time to push it as far as I can. Um, <clears throat> but for now, you know, I think it is already at a place where I can kind of showcase it pretty well, and it's starting to look pretty decent. Uh, you know, not a lot of detail yet. I've started kind of laying down just a foundation on everything, um, but a lot of it's still sort of a little blurry. Um, I've got like a cloth texture going on here that I'm not quite sure that I really want quite yet. I think it's a little bit more than I want because I kind of want more of this hand-painted look that you've got on the hair than the rest of the body. Uh, the scarf a little bit. The scarf's looking a little rough too right now. Um, but it's all getting close. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. I think I'm going to start in Maya today. And then if time uh, allows me to... Hey, how's it going? Can you remind me who you are again? Critical cantaloupe? Um, but yeah, then I'll get to Marmoset uh, later on, uh, depending on how much time we've got left. Um, I know that we don't have Marmoset in the labs or anything, but you can get a free 30-day trial, and it's a pretty affordable piece of software. I think it's like 140 bucks now. Uh, let me check real quick. Let's take a look at their website. Uh, it's definitely worth the investment if you're interested in becoming a modeler and texture artist. Uh, it's a really great tool for for displaying these things. Yeah, okay, it's about 150 now. Um, but it's pretty awesome. You can do a lot with it. Um, just a standalone renderer, uh, but it also comes with some nice uh, skyboxes and stuff. Uh, does some really nice PBR. Oh yeah, hey Riley. I thought so. I couldn't quite remember though. How are you doing? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So check it out if you want to. Um, keep in mind, 30-day trial. So maybe wait until you have your textures to a point where you want, and then start messing around with it. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's some documentation. Uh, yeah, there's some tutorials and stuff here. Uh, you can check out, um, learn a little bit about PBR, what it really is, um, and just then kind of go through some of the stuff on how to use it. Uh, I'll still talk about how to use it, too. It's pretty simple. You pretty much drag your materials onto your object, and then you just add the textures that you need into the proper slots. Uh, yeah, the 150 version comes with absolutely everything. Um, the, the lower price, I think, was just if you were upgrading from the old version. Uh, so what I, I have two already, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I think I'm going to start just by looking at my textures in Photoshop. Um, so I'll get that open. Let's see. Just so you can kind of get a feel for how I have everything laid out. There's a few little things that I still need to do uh, to my own character. But, you know, reminder, this is kind of what I'm going for. I really like the hand-painted kind of <clears throat> look that he's got going on, that the concept artist has done. Uh, I still haven't done the weapon yet, so that's still on my plate. Um, the model is done, but I haven't done any texture work or sculpting yet. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the look I'm going for. Um, you can see that I've taken it a little bit further than just the, um, the color block out. So for the clothing, I have mine set in two UV maps. I have my clothing and I have my uh, head and scarf kind of area. And 
I kind of took a different approach to both of them just to kind of show you two different ways to do it. Uh, partially that is just that I haven't gotten to the other stuff on either one. Um, I haven't gotten to the other thing. So, so for the clothing, I have pretty much done my base layer of texture and then I have of color. And then I started to lay down a few photo textures, but really, really light because I don't want to see them too heavily on the object. I think I actually need to pull it back a little bit more, but for today, I'm going to leave it alone. Um, so you can see I pulled in, actually, let me pull up some of the source textures. Uh, let's see, where are these? One sec, I'm just going through my, uh, on the other window and for my texture library. Fabrics. So I think these are some of the ones that I shared with you guys too. Um, okay, yeah, so I used this one a little bit. And I think, yeah, I used this one. So this is the one that I'm using uh, on the jacket. And then this one I'm using on the gloves. Uh, so neither of them are exactly what I want the fabric to be. But it just kind of gives that indication that it is a fabric object. Uh, so I'm doing a very, very, very light. Uh, overlay on those so I can show you what that looks like uh, let's see jacket so you can see I have my group down here for the jacket uh, and this is really all it is it's the jacket base color and then an overlay of 27% of the red uh, and I just kind of clone stamped it around uh, to to make that work and I can show you really quickly how that works if you're not familiar so I'm going to set this back to normal 100 real quick um, Let's make a duplicate of this, put it over top. So say that your texture only covers this one small area. Um, some of the textures that I gave you are tileable and you could just, uh, let's see, I'll open one real quick and just show you how you could set that up. Uh, it's incredibly simple. Um, but just in case you haven't done it before, um, let's see, I'll just set my canvas size to 5,000 by 5,000, so it uh, should be able to fit four of these on. Oh, first, you have to unlock this layer. It's going to add the black, so when you do the scale up, so let me just change that real quick. Okay, so now Photoshop snaps things too, which is really nice. Uh, so anyway, I'm just going to duplicate this layer, and you would just do this in your workspace. I'm just holding shift down, and it'll kind of snap. You'll see this gap, but that's just because we're at this weird percentage. Uh, then you can just do these two, drag them down, and you see if I zoom in, that gap kind of goes away. That's just a rendering issue with Photoshop, uh, and I can merge these layers. So this one was pre-tileable, meaning that like it'll you know it seamlessly goes into the next to the top and bottom. Um, but if you you know say you just had to get like a little bit more, and it's not a tileable texture, you could just use the clone stamp uh, tool, and just like any other brush, you know I'm using uh, the brackets to go up and down with my uh, brush size and if you hold alt you get this little icon and basically that's just gonna tell you like wherever I click now it's going to sample from that point and then if I go over here now without unclicked I'm just brushing and it's basically just duplicating everything from over here so with things like cloth like it's such a fine texture like yeah there's gonna be a little bit of weirdness in here but for the most part this still works pretty well like I think my seam is probably like somewhere around here now uh, but you can't really tell, and since I'm only doing it at like 27% anyway, uh, it doesn't really matter. So you're never going to notice it. So I'm going to set this back to overlay and 27. Uh, and it just gives me a little bit of grip and a little bit of texture, not much. Um, so I did the same thing on the gloves. Let's see, I just have this one cloth here. Not a whole lot. And then also to the legs, I believe I did the same thing. Uh, fabric and then I also did uh, the circles which I think I showed you how to do before it's just these effects basically um, and again I did a solid color and then if you turn fill down that basically gets rid of the uh, it turns opacity down on the actual object but it leaves um, the opacity at full 100% uh, for your actual effects so I just did a stroke to give me a little bit of an orange line and then an inner glow uh, which I then changed from being a glow to like just a color by making it multiply and set it to this color. Uh, and then again, on top of that is the fabric. Very, very light, 
overlay 63%. This one was a lighter image, so I was able to keep it a little bit higher. Um, your opacity ranges are going to vary greatly depending on you know the actual source content that you're using for your texture. Uh, and you'll notice that I've got a little bit of other noise to sort of breaking all of this up. It's very subtle, but you know this is not a solid color, and that's coming from these two rust images. I think I mentioned before, like I really like using rust. Uh, rust is a fantastic uh, source for just adding. You know, keeping it very, very low, but it just sort of gives you a much more organic noise than just the noise is going to give you in Photoshop. Uh, noise in Photoshop is pretty much just going to give you black and white dots, uh, or you can set it to color, but it's just going to be a bunch of dots and just literal noise. So this way, um, I find that Rust really works pretty well for a lot of stuff. So I, I just picked two different Rusts that I thought were interesting uh, that kind of gave me um, the, uh, the frequency of noise that I was looking for. So I can show you what these look like at normal. So I just scaled this one up, uh, which generally you don't want to scale up too much because it's just going to soften everything quite a bit. Um, but since I'm just using this to sort of break things up a little bit, scaling it up isn't really that big of a deal. Uh, so set this back to overlay, and I think it had it at, so, you know, then you just kind of dial in something that you like. This is obviously too much. Uh, this still makes it feel a little bit metallic, but putting it at 8 kind of takes care of that. Uh, and let's just take a look at this one. This one was a more even... Um, even noise so this is another one that's pretty good uh, and I think I'm pretty sure I put both of these into the uh, texture files that I gave you guys so just taking a drink of water um, okay go back to overlay I'm just setting this back to what it was before and save make sure I save everything um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm probably, you know, I'm still going to go in and do some of the more detailed work. Obviously, the gloves need a lot of hand painting. Um, I need to do a few things to offset the jewels. So there's, uh, I need to do that in the specular map uh, to make this a little bit lighter than everything else. Um, and there's some little noise and stuff. And uh, basically, because of the way that I did my texture bake using uh, X Normal, um, I have a little bit of a line, and that's just, that's really not something you need to concern yourself with. But that just comes. This is basically an artifact of uh, doing the model in ZBrush and then in Maya. Like, I need to rebake this from ZBrush instead of from the Maya model. Um, but that is really not something you guys are going to need to worry about. Um, you can see I also saved out a specular map. Uh, if I didn't have the specular map... Or hold on a second. Yeah, let me go to the body. Um, and I'll show this off in Maya in a bit. But, you know, I have these a gloss and a specular map. Uh, and if I turn these off... You'll see the light doesn't hit it the same anymore. It doesn't look bad, but I wanted the light to kind of catch it just a little bit differently. And actually, I probably want to come down a little bit with this now that I'm looking at it. But again, this just picks up little highlights as you rotate around it. Um, I'll get into what gloss and spec are. Um, but anyway, so we see the bottom half has that really nice soft kind of cloth feel to everything. Um, it's because I literally put uh, cloth like fabric textures on it. Um, now up here is more of the hand painted look that I'm looking for. I just need to tighten things up a little bit. Uh, and I'm also using a little bit of a subsurface material on her skin, which is why that's looking so nice. Because um, my texture map for the skin right now is almost non-existent. Um, I just spent some time on the material. Uh, so let's take a look at that texture real quick. So this is my head. You can see, like I said, the head, basically I have my occlusion map, which I baked out of X normal. Um, and I think I still need to kind of make up a t tutorial for you guys if you want to make occlusion maps out of Maya. Um, but the other thing to consider is we can also just render an ambient occlusion pass out of Maya. And then in our final composite, we can essentially get the same thing. So what I'm doing is basically just baking that occlusion in so it's all part of one render uh, because I'm doing it in Marmoset because I'm kind of more planning this for like a game engine type thing. Uh, so this one, um, I did use ZBrush to do some of my hand painting, uh, and I can show you kind of what that looks like. Um, so I actually just did some poly painting in ZBrush to get a few of these things. Uh, and I know that that's not necessarily an option for you guys, but these are really simple uh, textures that I could have very easily hand painted in uh, Photoshop. I just, for my sake, I prefer to do it in ZBrush. 
Um, but yeah, like you can see, it's nothing too complicated. Just laying a few values down with a soft brush. I had my base color. Um, again, um, using uh, the rust overlays. I can turn those off for a little while so you can see a little bit more clearly. Uh, it's just my baked occlusion map, but if I turn that off, you can see it's just this. So the hair, I did end up doing a little bit of color correction on. Uh, so if I turn these off, you can see this color correction was on my occlusion layer because I wanted to use my occlusion to drive some of the uh, color. Uh, I'm sorry, I know this is kind of going through this a little bit fast, but if anyone is more interested in some of this, I'd be happy to kind of talk about it with you uh, later. Um, but you know, like I said before, using these adjustment layers rather than just doing the uh, doing it through the menu because then I can turn them on and off, I can adjust them. You know, if I bake a new ambient occlusion map out that's a little bit different value, then I can change my levels on that. Um, but yeah, so this is what I have without the painting, and then this is with the painting that I did. Uh, and I still want to take this a little bit further, but for the sake of this demo, I think this is already pretty, pretty good. Um, you can see the skin has absolutely nothing on it right now. Uh, the scarf just has a little bit of this hand paint. Uh, just kind of, uh, the original model has a lot of these sort of like out of focus circles kind of on here. Uh, which could theoretically be the snow, but I kind of like putting it into the texture. I sort of like the effect that that gives, so I'm putting some of that in. Um, and let's see, just with the mouse, I mean, you can come in and do a little bit more if I wanted to. You know, maybe I want to, like, tighten the lines around this. Uh, just switching to my tablet real quick. Um, let's take a look. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'm just doing a super quick demo, and then I'm going to get to Maya. So uh, let's get a color that looks nice. I think that's good, and then I want to darken that a little. Move that a little more towards the orange. So let's see. I can kind of tighten these up a little bit. I'm not fantastic at painting in Photoshop, so. Also, another thing that's nice in Photoshop, remember uh, when you're drawing, you can hit R at any time and hold it down and drag and rotate your canvas. Um, this helps a lot, like just with, with regular drawing, when you move your... Uh, you know, you move your sketchbook around because it's just sometimes doing like curved lines like this is easier. Um, turn my opacity down a little. It's easier just when you're actually going with the arch of your hand. So doing it down sometimes can be a little tricky. You see, I get that kind of wobbly line. Um, I'm also just not super practiced at this, so. Sometimes doing the hand stuff doesn't work out so well for me. Uh, for whatever reason, painting in ZBrush works much better for me. It's pretty much the exact same process on a 3D model, but... I don't know, something about the feel of the brushes in there for me works better, but I think it's just because I'm used to it. Um, you know, I could also even come in and, like... Uh, yeah, I'm going to want to blur this a little bit. Well, for now, I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> I don't want to make you sit here and watch me just try to paint that because um, that's not even the one I, way I'm going to do my final painting. Um, but anyway, so then I saved these out. Um, oh, wait, I should get to... Um, uh, let's see. Before I move on, um, normal map is probably not going to apply to you. The reason I have a normal map is because I actually had to bake it from my uh, ZBrush model. So, you know, you can see, like, I actually did a lot of sculpting and I have stuff like... If I go to the hair, for example, uh, I'm going to turn the colorize off. You can see there's a lot of detail here that I sculpted in. If I turn it down, like that's what the base mesh looks like. So there's some tight edges and stuff that I need to bake out. This is still a pretty simple character, so like my normal maps aren't like super, super detailed the way that they might be if I was doing a photorealistic character. Um, but anyway, so you guys aren't doing that, so I don't think you need to really worry about normal map too much. Um, the one place that you might want to use it is if you were doing like a little bit of cloth like I did, like if you have like some sort of a cloth texture or anything specific that you want to add. Um, let's see, do I add that? I didn't even add that to mine. Right now the normal map is just this. So let me show you real quick how to do that. Um, so it kind of depends on how you want to do it. Uh, if you don't care about these values, um, let me just show you. 
So first thing I would do is Control Shift Alt E if you're on the PC. I can't remember what it is on Mac, but just Google it. Uh, you're basically Googling how to, uh, what would be the word? It's basically creating a duplicate layer of every visible. So I think it's duplicate visible. If you look up duplicate visible uh, in Google, it'll probably tell you how to do it on a Mac. Uh, so anyway, what that does is bakes every visible layer into one map. I'm gonna drop that into my normals folder. And you should have, I think the newest versions of Photoshop have this filter. Um, if not, let me know and I'll see if I can find another way to do this. Um, I think Crazy Bump is a free program that you could use to do this. Uh, X Normal is also free and X Normal comes with um, uh, height to, uh, is it height to normals also. So you could just make your image into a grayscale and then do height to normals. But I think you should now have this 3D uh, generate normal map. So let's just do that. The problem is like with these different values, that's going to change uh, a lot of stuff, um, give you different values than you might want. So I'm gonna show you first how this looks. Yeah, like see these circles? We don't actually want that to look like a bumped surface. Um, so I'd wanna turn that off first. Um, but then all you do is set it to overlay and you'll see now I have a little bit of a cloth texture <clears throat> on my uh, jacket. Um, so, you know, we're not going to get, like, the really big, deep stuff like the hair that I have here. Um, solely because we don't have that kind of detail in our models, necessarily. But putting these little finer details in here can be pretty nice. And you can just kind of take the model just up just a tiny little level. Um, so let me uh, show you the other way to do this, then. If you have it just on a specific area that you want to do, um, let's see. You're going to have to kind of go through each one of these. Turn the shoes off because I don't need the shoes. Toggle some clasps I don't need. Uh, so just want jacket and gloves. So what I am going to do is I'm going to duplicate this layer. Call it a uh, for normal map. Set it to normal. Set it to 100. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the glove texture. Or, and then I'm going to just turn these back off once I'm done making this. All right. And I can actually turn visibility off on all the stuff that, oh yeah, I don't need legs either. So I just want this cloth texture. Now again, you can see if I go, if I switch to grayscale, and Andy, who might be looking right now, uh, hey Chris, how's it going, man? Uh, Showed me this nice trick, which is if you want to just kind of look at your stuff in grayscale, put a black layer of black on top of everything. Just set this to color. So immediately you can see we have very different values here. Um, and we want similar values to create our normal map because otherwise it'll just kind of raise and lower things in a way that we don't want. Uh, so I'm going to take the, I'm going to leave this one because the jacket is pretty much uh, middle ground. And I'm going to just create a levels for this one. And I'm just going to kind of adjust it until, kind of eyeballing it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, bumping the contrast a little bit just by basically pushing these in, the left and right ones in will just kind of increase contrast. And then your middle one is your gamma, which basically sets the, um, the middle, the middle value, the mid value for your object. So that's pretty close right there. I'm just going to go with that. Um, so again, oh, and to do the uh, Control Shift E uh, duplicate visible thing, you have to also be selecting a visible layer for some reason. So if I was up here on that, it wouldn't work. So let's do that real quick. I drag that into my normal map. I turn this off. This is just going to be. I'm going to call this my desaturation level. Let's save real quick on that. And then before I forget, let me just turn these two layers off. So now my diffuse is back to normal once I turn every other layer back on. Yeah, so now my diffuse is, oh wait, oh, what am I missing here? I am missing the gloves. Oh yeah, because I turned this off, okay. <laughs> Shout out indeed. Sorry, I had to drink some coffee. Uh, all right, so where were we? Normal map. So now we have just the cloth textures here. Um, I'm just going to do the uh, 3D 
or no, filter, 3D, generate, normal map. So now we're not going to get all that extra stuff that we had in there. I was going to hit OK. The defaults are usually fine. And then actually, the default, the default that whole interface that we just saw for a second is kind of convoluted. I don't really know exactly how it works. So I usually will just take the accept the defaults. Audio is getting low. All right, I'll stay a little closer to the mic. Uh, I found that adjusting the microphone audio in op the open broadcast software like only works if I restart, which would mean that I disconnect. So let me know how this is right now, and I'll try to just make sure that I stay close to the mic. Um, okay, so yeah, I like to make my adjustments. I basically just like to accept the defaults and then make my adjustments to the layer once it's taken care of. Uh, or once it's been converted. Um, so again, just set this to overlay. Um, this actually looks like it's kind of harsh right now. Because uh, you remember, I really wanted to go with uh, some subtlety on this one. So I'm just going to literally just drop this down to maybe 20 or so. Uh, maybe even lower than that. Well, mm, 16. Go 16, that's a good number. Uh, I'm going to call this fabric overlay. Call this one... I always put this background down here, which is just the plain uh, mid-range of the normal map. Um, you don't really even need it necessarily, but I just like it there. It kind of makes everything a little cleaner and easier to look at. Um, base normal. All right, so let's save this out. I'm just going to stick with JPEGs for now. Uh, I'm going to my Maya source images folder. And let's see, clothing, N. I'm just going to overwrite that. You can make multiple versions. Obviously, make multiple versions specifically if you're doing different variations on your model, if you want to try a bunch of different colors and stuff. Uh, for me right now, I'm not doing variations. I'm just updating it with the fabric now, uh, which is a variation, but it's not one that I'm really too concerned with, um, with overwriting, because I can just turn it off really quickly. So hit and save on that. Uh, do the same thing here. Make sure, just in case, I think I already have the newest one saved, but I'm just going to go through and save it out anyway just to make absolutely sure. So yeah, clothing, D01. Um, I guess I could put all the O1s in there. I'm just gonna leave it alone for now because it's already connected in a few programs. <clears throat> all right, and specular, uh, I pretty much did the same thing as normal map for this. Only rather than do the converting to normal, I just did a desaturation, which is actually in my specular layer. So you can see in specular, I know I have a lot of stuff over here, but I have my base color. Uh, I have this, the base color I think was just reference. I don't think that's doing anything. Yeah, so I can actually get rid of that. So this is just sort of my gray layer to sort of set the value, because uh, everything is kind of being multiplied or overlaid. Um, so you'll see I have uh, basically what I just did before in the other layers of changing the values, I just decided to do on the fly in the specular layer. So that way I could just keep dropping them in uh, and I just have these layer masks basically that are and then I using the uh, alt click I'm doing levels just on those so you can see this way I have control over just those values um, and then because I was doing a PBR texture in my marmoset uh, render I have a gloss setting which is a little bit lighter and then my spec setting which darkens everything considerably um, all you guys need to worry about is spec. And for your specular map, you're actually going to want to get this more of a mid-range. Uh, maybe something like this, probably. And you want to get a little bit of contrast out of it, too. Most likely. Um, I'm just going to undo that, because for me, I actually wanted to... I actually want the PBR stuff. Um, so anyway, those are already saved out. So let's go to the head. Uh, we don't really have any kind of fabric stuff on this yet, so this is just going to get saved as is. It's going to my uh, source images, and this was my head normal. Just save over that. I don't think I've made any changes, but just in case. And diffuse. Let's save that out too. Okay. 
right, and I think that's it for Photoshop for now. So let's move over to Maya. I think I might have to take a second to set up my Maya scene. Uh, I was actually, I'm having to re-UV my jacket. Um, I won't really bother you with why that is, but it just has to do with, uh, I screwed something up in ZBrush and I'm having to redo some stuff. Um, so bear with me here. You can just see they don't quite line up right. So when I was doing uh, my re-import, it was screwing everything up down around here. Uh, so I'm going to end up using this one, um, but it's not UV right now. So this is basically the one that's selected currently is going to be for my final model. Um, but don't need to worry about that because for now I'm using this one. And this is the same one that's in Marmoset right now. Um, but you can see, like, basically what I was just describing, that's why this whole thing is kind of off and messy around here. So... Uh, and you can see, like, the sculpting I did on this dress at the bottom, like, that's, or the jacket, like, that's not final at all. That's pretty messy still, too. Um, but I just wanted to kind of get it on there. Uh, and the thing is, I like to, a lot of times I like to set these beta renders up before I'm actually finished with the character. For one, sometimes you just get kind of bogged down with the character, and you haven't really made changes that make it look different quite yet, and you just want to see what it's going to look like. And sometimes you just need to see something that looks nice to kind of keep your energy up and keep you going and working on the model. Um... So like this way, now that all of my lighting and stuff is set up and I like the way things look, it's just a matter of, you know, going into Photoshop or going into ZBrush, painting a little bit more texture, hit save, test it out, see how it works. Because basically the way these are work is every time that I save a new version, it's just going to automatically update it. Um, so it's really nice to have, you know, a Marmoset. The reason I like Marmoset is because it's instant. It's all real time. Uh, Maya, you can definitely get better results overall, but... Um, well, I guess that's arguable, but yeah, if you're really if you're really good with Maya and Mental Ray, you can get you can almost definitely get a better result with Maya and Men Mental Ray, especially if you're going for like real photorealism. Um, but you don't have the instant feedback, so Marmoset really does a great job of giving you in instant feedback. Um, and for the current game I'm working on, we actually, or I guess the most recent one, did a bunch of artifact models, and we ended up just using Marmoset for all of our beauty renders because. For one, it get you know we also eventually want to make a real time viewer for them, and this gives you a better idea of like this is the level of quality it actually will be in real time. Plus, it's just instant. You know, you finish modeling the thing and you throw it in Marmoset. You spend about five minutes on the lighting and materials, and then you've got your beauty render ready to get put into the uh, all the button assets and everything. Um, so anyway, that was a long ramble. Went back to Maya. Um, yeah, as you can see, I've got this model here, but it definitely needs some work still. Uh, so I'm just going to hide this for now. Uh, let's just look at... Hmm. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to make a new scene. Because I did start, I still have the lighting in here that I did last week. Uh, just turn that on real quick. And apparently freeze everything. Alright, there we go. Um, so this is my scene. This is essentially, we're going to recreate this. Uh, I'm going to try to do it a little bit differently this time, but we're pretty much going to have this same setup. We have our, uh, our key light here, we have our fill light over here, and then we have our rim light back here, and then I have an HDR map around the whole scene just to sort of break everything up a little bit and make it just a little more interesting. Um, in case you don't get a chance to watch last week's, the reason that I use the HDR and what that's doing is it's basically casting these values from every angle. Because um, one of the big things in CG that kind of makes things feel CG and kind of fake is the fact that, you know, even if you do a two or three light setup and you turn global illumination on, which will have your lights bounce around the scene, um, you're still going to have... Uh, the issue with the fact that like in the real world there is just stuff with different colors and values everywhere unless you are actually doing a studio lighting setup for like a product or something like that um so what that means is like your body at any given time is being hit with rays of light that are just hundreds of thousands of different colors uh, and that's what we're used to seeing on a daily basis so the second that we have all of those colors and little bits of like uh light stripped away and we just have like maybe one two or three values all of a sudden our, you know our eyes immediately catch that and notice that this doesn't look right so ibl or image-based lighting is something that was developed uh i don't know when 10 or 15 maybe more years ago 
Um, but it basically fakes that. Um, to truly calculate that would just be uh, a ridiculous drain on resources. Plus, you would also need like an entire environment. Um, so by creating these uh, spherical nodes, you can get really close to that. So these, these are basically panoramic images uh, that are taken, just photographic images. Um, the reason that it's called HDR is that it's these it's a high dynamic range, meaning that um, you know each uh, angle that was photographed, you know, was uh, what's it called um, bracketed. So that way, then you use certain software to basically get the highest possible range out of each of those uh, thirty-two bit image raw images that you capture, and you just basically get a really nice uh, even lighting. Um, Hey Chris, uh, Sketchfab. I have I have an account with Sketchfab. I still haven't used it. Um, I did want to check it out because they recently added the viewer to ArtStation. Um, is Sketchfab free? I can't remember. I guess I can check real quick. But yeah, Sketchfab is definitely another good option. Um, I think they were actually around before Marmoset. Um, let's see. Yeah, because Sketchfab actually allows, allows you to sell assets and stuff too. I think. Um, yeah, it's some pretty cool stuff here. I'll have to give it a shot sometime. It takes a second to load. Um, that's always the case, though. Come on, come on, here we go. What do you look like? Silicoid. Yeah, maybe I'll do this one in Sketchfab, too. I can just host it on both on this site and on ArtStation. Be worth it. Always fun learning new stuff. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. So there's animations, too. That's really nice to know. So yeah, so later on, if you guys make walk cycles or do any fun animations and stuff, you can theoretically host it this way. Because um, really, there's like, you know, before things like this, you wanted to show your models off. If you wanted to show every angle, you either had to render out a bunch of still images from each side, or you had to do like a demo reel where you had to show the character from every direction. Yeah, this looks awesome. Um, and you had to do like turntables and stuff like that, which can just take a while. And life is so much easier now for modelers um, because now you can just, you know, make your scene in Marmoset or Sketchfab or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to check, check this out later. Um, but then, you know, you do that and the whole model can be viewed from, viewed from any angle. So you want to set this up on your portfolio or website. You know, you don't even have to bother taking the days and stuff that it takes to make like a three or four minute demo reel or maybe even two minute demo reel. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So that's an option too. Feel free to check this out. Apparently this is free, so maybe I can try this out this week and then show you guys how it works next week. Um, we'll see. But anyway, back to Maya for now, since that is what we are working in for the most part. Um, so let's see. I think I'm going to actually start this whole scene over just to show you guys, just to have like a clear view of exactly how to set this up. So I'm going to save. Actually, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to delete everything else in the scene except for my character. I'm going to give her just a plain old Lambert and da, da, da. let's see, got to open the hypershade and I'm going to delete unused nodes. Uh, I kept a few of them and that's because I have different nodes applied in different render layers so I'm going to delete all my render layers. Basically just going back to square one on this. It's always good to kind of clear things out sometimes and just start working on a new file. So in this instance, I'm ready to do my beauty render for the character, so I'm kind of getting rid of all the extra stuff. I'm getting rid of the render layers that I had set up to work on my UVs and modeling in. Um, <clears throat> just clearing all that out, deleting unused nodes. So you can see I just have the Lambert now. I have my mid-res model. Uh, I also had a low-res one that I was working on, but we're not looking at that right now. Um, oh, cool. Sketchfab also works with VR and headsets. Yeah, I had I was borrowing an Oculus for a little while, but I had to give it back. Um, still trying to decide if I'm actually going to buy one yet or not. Uh, Alright, so anyway, file save. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, Girl Beauty Render Demo 01, in case I need to make a second version. And... All right, so let's get started. 
So the first thing I'm going to want is a plane or something to ground her. Uh, you know, so I don't want her floating in space. Uh, that's all she is in Mar Marmoset right now, and I'm okay with that. But <clears throat> eventually I'm going to probably want to ground this. Uh, depending if I'm showing it on Marmosets uh, through Art Station, I might leave the ground out of it. Um, although I think for my final, I'm actually going to sculpt the ground a little bit because I want to do... Uh, I want to do this kind of cracked thing and then i'll probably like make that into like a sort of a trophy kind of look of things or just sort of sort of like it's though the model is like actually mounted uh which theoretically then i could actually do a 3d print of which you know who doesn't want that um yeah i'm really curious about the steam vr stuff i'm also really curious about the vive and ho really all of it i think hololens could be cool that's gonna be a totally different experience but I think HoloLens could be pretty neat when it comes to um, doing, like, augmented reality tabletop games or something like that. That could be really, really, really fun. Uh, but it'll also be really expensive because everyone would have to have a HoloLens. Um, but, you know, it's kind of neat to see someone doing something different, too, because we have our full VR sets, and I think both of those are going to be neat. Um, it's also really fun if you have Unreal Engine. It's really easy to just kind of test out the stuff that you're doing in Oculus, which is really cool. Um, but that's another tangent. All right, so going back to Maya. All right, so first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to make a plane. And you can see that's putting in the head, and that's because of the way that I modeled her, uh, and I'm not going to move her yet because I'm still, when I send UVs back to ZBrush or back and forth, the model needs to be the same scale and location in Z space or in world space. Um, so, like, if I was absolutely finished with the model, what I would do is take this group and I would snap my uh, pivot down to there. I'd go to my front view, and I'd actually orient her to the front, too. Uh, I'm going to undo all this, but just so you can see. And then I would move this up and turn my grid on. And I would snap it to the ground plane. And this is what we're going to do with all of our characters before we start rigging. Um, we need to make sure that they're facing forward in Z, and we need to make sure that they are set to this world space. Um, so since this is just a temporary thing, I'll just actually keep this. I was thinking I was going to go back, but I'll just leave it like this now. Um, and then obviously her ground plane is super teeny right now. So let's scale this up maybe to 50. So it's up to you. We could do like a neat um, like spotlight kind of thing where we just kind of have the ground sort of fade out into black and we never see it. We just set this to like 500 and like, but the thing, the main thing that I want to avoid is having like this alpha channel cutting across her. Um, so let's do, I'm going to do two different uh, variations for this. I'm going to do my flat and then I'm going to also do like a studio kind of setup. So let me hide this real quick. And I just realized my background looks really close to uh, the default Lambert. I'm going to darken that real quick. Uh, if you ever decide you don't like the background color that you're working with, uh, you can always change that. Um, I think it's in general editors. No, let's see. I haven't done this for a little while. Uh, color settings. So settings and preferences, color settings. And if you go to uh, general... Is it user defined? No. Uh, background, yeah. So I can just change my background color to whatever I want. Or I could turn the gradient on, but I don't really like the gradient very much. I like the solid color better. Uh, so let's go a little bit darker than these. All right. I'll turn my wireframe off also for now. So this is going to be more of like a studio backdrop. There's probably an actual word for this. I don't know what it is. Um, so I'm not going to use it. We'll scale this one up to 25 or so. Um, so this one, I basically want to be able to take a render of her from the front, and I want there to be no alpha channel behind her. I want there to be like an actual studio backdrop. Um, I'm just Googling real quick to see if I can find an example of this. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what I'm talking about. So something like this, where it's just like a white kind of sheet that comes down and back, and that way it's just like you're really featuring your model. Uh, so this will be really easy to do. Um, just move it forward a little bit. Take this edge. Move it up. 
maybe. Uh, I just need to make sure that it fully is behind her. Take this edge, snap it holding V to back here. And we move this one back a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to bevel this to basically round it out and just up my uh, segments to just kind of make that a nice smooth transition. And there we go. That's pretty much it. Uh, and I don't really need all this in the front either. So just deleting those. Uh, and then I'm just going to scale this up a little bit. Uh, the pivot point is now on the ground right under her feet. So I'm going to scale this up to maybe 50. Um, yeah, there we go. So now uh, we have two different options for our background. We have, uh, and actually let's put these on display layers. Um, and delete this display layer because I don't remember what that was. So this is the studio back. And then this is going to go into flat back. Okay, so now I can turn visibility of this one on. And I just need to make sure that I only have one of these on at a time. So I can turn studio off and we have that. And the lighting is essentially going to be the same for both of these. Um, I may, actually no, I'm probably going to do a, for the flat, I'll do a spotlight uh, lighting thing. Oh, that background thing is called a fill, Andy. Yeah, I don't really know much about studio lighting. I've done a lot of lighting and stuff for 3D. I'm um, definitely not an expert. I don't really know a whole lot about real world. I know that, I mean, for the most part, what we're trying to do is recreate real world lighting. Um, I just have not done it in the real world, so I don't know what the name of anything is. Um, so anyway, we're going to do a, a little bit of a spotlight setup for this one and try to kind of get it, get it set up so that, like, basically just fades to black. Uh, and then this one is going to be the studio. So let's do the studio first. Uh, this is going to be pretty much the same setup that I did before. Um, but I can kind of show you a few differences. Um, other thing that you want to do, um, depending on what version of Maya you have, uh, hopefully you have Mental Ray loaded already. Um, so to check, what you're going to want to do is click on the little uh, icon right here next to IPR, uh, which is just sort of like the it's display render settings, as you can see. Uh, it has a little gear next to it. Um, so this brings up our render settings, and we're going to want to switch this to Mental Ray. Uh, if it's at Maya software right now and the mental ray is not an option for you, uh, hopefully all that you need to do is go to Windows, Settings and Preferences, Plugin Manager. You're going to find the one that is Maya 2MR, I believe it's called. Yeah, Maya 2MR. I'm going to set that to auto load. Basically, both of these should be checked. If this is not in your list anywhere, you're going to actually have to go to Autodesk's website and download the mental ray renderer and install it. Uh, it's a really easy process. You just... Um, it's just, uh, it's just a note. For some reason, with Maya 2016, they stopped packaging it with Mental Ray, and I don't understand why. It's just, it literally was just a hey, let's just make this a little more annoying for everybody. And that's all that they did. Uh, maybe I, I would imagine there's some reason why, but from the outside, I can't really see it being anything more than just we want to annoy people a little bit. Um, I'm sure that's not really it, but you know. Uh, okay, so anyway, with Mental Ray loaded. Um, let's just look at our settings real quick. Um, we have our common tab, which this is basically all of the information for like how we're going to render it out in terms of like what kind of file format are we doing. Um, and this is more for batch rendering. So when we do our regular rendering through the, uh, the render window, um, the preview window, we have the option to save our render out as any format that we want. Um, but if we were doing a batch render, for example, for like an animation, which we will be doing down the line, then you're going to want to do it through here because it's going to, you're basically going to click render and then Maya's just going to go through and render your entire frame sequence into a folder as an image sequence. Um, so it's good to know that this stuff is here. Uh, so, you know, we would just name it like a uh, character, let's see, snow girl. And another nice thing to know that I actually just didn't know and I discovered by accident when I was in school is if you do a backslash, this creates a new folder. Um, so then you can do snow girl um, beauty 01. Uh, and if we're doing multiple render layers, you could also do things like, um, you know, we'll split it out by that. So we could do beauty, uh, insert render layer, and then any render layer that we have turned on, it'll create a folder for that. 
I'll show all this stuff later, but you know, just I might as well go through it now just so you're kind of aware of this. And then Snow Girl. So now what it would do is whatever our render layers were named, I would have one called Beauty and Occlusion, which I'll actually make now because I'm going to need those. Beauty and Occlusion. So now if I were to hit a batch render out of this, uh, and I'm going to set this to PNG. Um, <clears throat> Oh, and the last thing too, there's the frame animation. So right now we just render whatever frame we're actually actively on. Um, but if I set it to uh, name, extension, and number, so this is the name of the file, the extension, which would be JPEG, PNG, whatever format it is, and then dot, oh yeah, we want number then extension. Um, then it would just be the sequence. So right now I have it set to one through 10. So it would just render frame one through 10. I have no animation right now. So it would just be 10 frames of the exact same thing. Um, but when, once we get to animation, that will change. Um, so going down, we have which camera do we want to render from? Um, so let's make one real quick. Just a regular standard camera, default everything. Uh, we're going to call it render cam. Call it whatever you want, just make sure you remember what it's called. Um, Andy, are you talking about you can, that you can download uh, Mental Ray from their site, or are you talking about like a, some sort of a fill light backdrop template? Sorry, there's like a 10 second delay, so I'm just waiting. Okay, Mental Ray. Yeah, yeah, it's on their website. I, It's just for some stupid reason it's not doesn't automatically install anymore uh some of you guys are on the student version it might be different um but anyway so now we see that the render cam shows up in renderable camera uh we want to make sure that we do render the alpha mask um which basically is just the alpha channel so like if i were to render the character with nothing behind her it will just be transparent it's not just going to like bake a black or a white behind her Okay, cool. Yeah, Mentor. Uh, and then just the, uh, you saw in the settings, um, or in the project requirements, there was a image size requirement. So this is where you could set the image size that you want to render out at. And I think that I worked out that this is a good vertical. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Sometimes it gets cut out like this. I think if I hit space, some, it's, mine is weird like this. So I could do uh, overscan with my camera, and this will, that should fill everything in. That nah, doesn't, I'm not sure how to, Chris probably knows. Um, <laughs> there's a way to make it that like the whole interior is framed properly. Whenever you do these vertical ones, it gets really wonky because, you know, my monitor is uh, landscape uh, aspect ratio, so it doesn't like this too much. Um, but anyway, let's uh, not worry about that for now. Um, so common, I think that's about everything. Um, there's also a, this other thing in here under the render options, the enable default light. So this makes it that if there's not a single light in your scene, your model will still sort of light itself or be lit by a default light. Um, we can just leave that checked for now. I'm pretty sure that once you add a light, it overrides that entirely. Um, so I'm just gonna leave that alone for now. Uh, but if you're noticing that like your lighting is not doing quite what you want, maybe try disabling this. Um, so that's everything for common. Uh, sit and save real quick. Um, so quality uh, has changed considerably. So if you've used Maya 2014 or uh, earlier, or even 15, I think is a little different. You'll notice that they've really changed this a lot. Uh, I can't really say that I like it too much because they took away a lot of options. Even with advanced settings, they give you like, I think one extra thing. Um, but at the same time, I think it is probably easier now. There's basically a quality tab, a quality drop uh, drag thing. Um, and that's pretty much it. There's not a whole lot more than that. Um, and then you can decide if you want GI turned on and turn it off for now. Um, GI is just basically the bounce light. So that is, you need that turned on when we get to the HDR stuff. Uh, Final Gather is just an, kind of another variation of that. I can't remember the exact difference of how they calculate everything, but uh, we're going to be using Global Elimination. That's what GI stands for. But anyway, yeah, they took away a lot of options, and it really 
makes me unhappy. Um, but that's just how it is. Uh, you know, sometimes it makes things easier for people to learn, which is great, but I still like having the options to kind of do things on my own. Anyway, uh, so we have overall quality. Uh, I'm actually going to start with like 0.5. So this, this is basically determining uh, if I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, it basically, it's controlling sampling. It's controlling um, the anti-aliasing. It's all this stuff that you used to have control over is now basically all determined by this quality slider. Uh, lighting quality, same thing. It's samples of the lights, uh, which are also you can set individually in the light itself. Um, and then this is just for like your material samples and stuff like that. So we're going to leave lighting quality and materials at one. Uh, we're going to leave volume sampling at one. Filtering is going to keep it Gauss. If you're doing like really high end stuff and you want to do a nice high resolution image, you're going to want to set this to Mitchell and start at least at four. Uh, probably no higher than four. You'd never want to really go higher than five because at five you're going to notice like you're you're really increasing the render size, uh, uh, render time, but the quality of the image is just not going to change at anything past even past four. You're hardly going to notice a difference. Um, trace jet depth and geometry we can leave those alone. Um, the defaults are perfectly fine. Go back to Gauss. Uh, if you really are having problems with your computer rendering slowly. Uh, you can either, I would say, keep it at Gauss and try doing a filter size of one or two and see what you get. Um, but you can also use the triangle filter. Uh, and these are basically set up in order of quality. Uh, so box is going to be the light, it's going to be the lowest quality, but it's going to render the fastest. Triangle is a little bit better than that. Gauss is kind of a good middle ground. Mitchell is going to be really nice quality, high level sampling, but the render time is going to be longer. And then uh, I guess Lan Lancos, Langzos, Lanxos. Uh, I've never actually used that one. I imagine uh, Mitchell really gives you what you need, so I don't think you really need to go any higher than that. Um, so let's leave that alone. Um, configuration and diagnostics, you don't need to really worry about right now. Um, this is for other higher end stuff that we're not really getting into right now. Scene is the only other thing that we need to think about. Uh, frame buffer, we're going to keep the same. So this is basically setting the bit rate. Uh, like, um, so if we were rendering uh, EXRs out of here, uh, or even TIFF, or I think Targa, we could do 30, and even PNG technically, you can do a 32-bit, but we just don't need that high. We don't need 32-bit images for this. So we're going to stick with RGBA half, which is red, green, blue, alpha at about half the, uh, it's like, it's a slightly better compression. It's going to be a bigger file than short, but it's it's still moderately compressed. Um, half basically, I guess is I guess float is basically uncompressed. Float is the name for uncompressed. That's the big 32-bit images, but we don't need that. Um, so leave that the same. Uh, passes we're not doing right now, so don't worry about that. And this has actually been simplified. This is a good example of it's been simplified, but it's actually better. Um, passes. Are still kind of awkward, but they're much better now. Uh, so environment lighting, we have our IBL that we've talked about a little bit, and this will create our IBL node, but we're not there yet. And we have physical sun and sky, which physical sun and sky is phenomenal for creating a really quick outdoor scene. Uh, I'm not going to show it right this second. I might show it later today. Um, but it basically gives you uh, a directional light, and you can rotate the directional light, and as you rotate it, it actually will give you uh, like different times of day. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, material set or lighting setup. Um, I would not recommend using it right now because the gamma is going to get blown out on anything that you do, uh, and you actually have to get into it a little bit and adjust some of your uh, camera lens values to make it look right. Um, you could always do a little bit. I mean, if you rendered it at least at 16-bit, you could still do color correction in Photoshop, but just don't use it right now. Uh, definitely feel free to experiment with it if you're, you know, on your own modeling some environments. Or uh, if you do, like, concept art, uh, I know, like, uh, Andy, for example, uses this a lot. Uh, it's a fantastic way to do a quick block in of a scene, do uh, a quick lighting pass, you know, that sets a good time of day, and then use that as, like, a paint over. So that's actually a great, great way to use it. Uh, but we're not using it right now for our beauty renders because we want to do a studio setup. Uh, so that's pretty much all you need to know about the render settings uh, for Mental Ray. Um, close that for now. Uh, I'm actually going to turn this off for now. Um, and let's go back to our model. Um, and let's take a look at our camera. So obviously we're a little tight on it right now. Uh, we'll look at camera settings real quick. Um, 
For the most part, you're going to want to leave it alone. Focal length is the only thing that you might end up wanting to change, uh, and that's depending on like what kind of a, a, a render you want to do. Um, let's also, I'm going to set this to 60 and 60 just so it's a more, I'm actually going to go 30. Um, so basically we just have 30 frames here. And I like to think of the timeline just as like these are different frame images that I'm going to render, uh, different angles that I'm going to render. So let's do panels, look through selected. So now I can see through my camera. And this is the render camera that I'm going to use to render everything. Let's see. Okay, now it's working for some reason. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, okay, cool. That is basically what my render frame is going to be, which is great. I don't know why I didn't want to do it for perspective. Um, but anyway, let's just start by doing something nice and tight like this, but full body. And what I'm going to do is select all of my translate and rotate values. I'm going to right click on them and do key selected. I'm going to, to, going to go to frame two. I'm going to try a different angle and maybe a little bit tighter just on the head. And all I'm doing is picking a couple angles that I want and I'm telling Maya to remember them. Uh, so you'll notice that I have auto key set on. I don't actually want that because I'm not doing animation. So every time that what that does is every time I rotate my camera, it's going to keyframe every value that is that I've set as being a keyable value. Uh, which right now is all translate and rotate. So for now it worked because, you know, this is what I want. But if I like forget that I have this turned on and I just start rotating around my model while I'm looking through this camera, it's gonna keep changing those keyframes. So I'm gonna turn this off now. And I'm also going to turn the flat back on and I'm going to try to come up with a different, um, we'll see how this goes. All right, let's just try just thinking here. Well, let's just see how these work. I think this will be okay. Just thinking here, sorry. Um, all right, so let's not worry about our render layers yet. Um, gonna open my uh, outliner now because I'm gonna start making some lights so you can see there's my camera and as I move it does its two angles uh, hit save real quick um, leave the flat on right now just because it's easier to look at everything this way um, but I'm going to create let's see I'm gonna start by creating a directional light and I'm just gonna do a quick three-point lighting setup with directional lights uh, to see what the difference is between that and using area um, so let's just create um, lights, directional. Um, and one thing with lights, lights are one thing that you don't want to duplicate um, because lights have certain nodes attached to them that you don't want to get disconnected. And if I duplicate them, it's not going to duplicate the whole uh, node uh, selection. Um, I don't know what every node does. I just know that for the most part, if you want to make multiple lights, don't duplicate. Keep creating them through the menu. Um, so one thing you could do is just set it up early and then hit G to make a new one. So now we have three directional lights. I'm going to group these. I'm going to call this uh, directional three point So now I know that at any time I can just turn these on. I can turn the visibility of the group on and off. And uh, so what I'm going to do, let's take our directional light one, be our fill. Uh, this is going to be our key. Actually, no. Let me switch these. Key. Fill. Uh, two L's. Take the one off of this now and make this our rim. So key, I want to do... This is The key is going to basically be the brightest light. It's going to be casting shadows. Uh... And this is going to do like most of our illumination and highlight the things that we really want to see. Um, so I'm actually going to, to test this out, I'm going to turn the visibility of these two off. So when I render, I only see, and I'm going to my uh, perspective, I'm going to my render cam again. Uh, so when I render, I'm only going to see the value of the light that's turned on. So let's just see what this looks like by default. I'm going to click render and wait just a second. 
So I just remembered that last time hitting render was completely disconnecting me over and over and over again. So I really hope that doesn't happen this time. I'm going to try to keep my settings pretty low to prevent that from happening. Uh, I think my connection's a little better today than it was. We'll see. This could get painful. If it gets too painful, uh, I might just record this video and put it up later. Um, put, uh, and I'll just switch to Marmoset to finish out uh, today. But we'll see. Um, all right. So that is one look. Uh, let's actually switch to IPR. But first thing I'm going to do is go to my options and do my test resolution, set it to 50. So this is just going to be half of the resolution. So when I do my final, if I, if I did a batch render, it will still be at the 1920 by 1440 that I have set. Um, but right now, it's just going to do it at sort of a half res for me. Now let's just turn all of these settings down because uh, I'm just doing tests. So 0.5, material 0.5, with gauze. Uh, actually switch to triangle for now. All right, let's see what we get here. So now I'm going to use IPR. So what this is, it's a preview. It's a kind of a real, uh, yeah, interactive photorealistic render. So it's um, basically going to bring up that same render window, but it's going to just update over and over again as I make changes, um, but only in the area that I drag into. This is still actually pretty big. I think I'm going to drop this down to, well, I'll leave it for now. We'll just see how it goes. So you see, I drag over this and it's just gonna start filling that in. And the nice thing about this is I can then work on my key light and set, uh, you know, maybe I want this at like 0.85. Um, no, I actually like like 1.1. And I'm gonna give it just a little bit of color. Not much. Okay, I think that's actually pretty good. Um, you know, I'm keeping it simple right now, so we're not we're not gonna spend forever trying to find a perfect setting. Um, but you know, if I want to change to a different area, I just check this down here, click here, and it'll just update real quickly. Um, and I like this angle; I think I like what that's doing. Um, I'm gonna come out of perspective. The nice thing too is it'll store that camera as long as it's active. So like, you know, if I rotate this little. So I kind of like that dramatic kind of side angle. Um, I might actually make it come in a little bit more straight. Uh, let's see what that's doing on the gloves. Oh, that's really blowing everything out right now, though. Let's go back down a little. Kind of like capturing just a little bit of the glove on the side there. So I'm just going back out. Maybe set this just back to 0.9. Darken everything a little. All right. I think that's pretty good. Um, so let's turn the fill on at the same time. The fill is basically just going to give us a little bit to take away these black blacks. Um, right now it's going to be a little too bright. Um, but basically the thing with the directional lights, all right, so once you turn one on, you actually have to refresh your uh, the IPR. Uh, I think it's is this the button. No, I'm just going to re-hit IPR. Uh, and it's going to do it from the active camera. So let's go back to render cam and IPR. Okay, so let's take a look at the fill light. So that's way too much right now. Uh, let's just drag this out of the way. So directional lights basically are going to be the same fall off value no matter where they are in the scene. Um, I can put this anywhere, it's gonna look exactly the same. You'll see that there's no drop down for fall off or anything in here. There's a shadow drop down so I can turn shadows on and off. I'm gonna keep them on for now. Um, but that's why I really like using the uh, area lights because you can get a really, really nice fall off with those. And it can be like from a pretty big light source. So it's point lights also have <coughs> really nice fall off, but you can't do like a wide area of light, like as though it's coming through a window or from like a big fill light or something like that. You can only do like these little points of light. Um, so this is way too bright right now. Let's go to like point two maybe. Um, and then as I do that, I'm realizing I actually want to go a little bit higher on this, I think. I think I might just keep it at one. Um, let's take the fill. I'm going to drag over more of the model so I get a feel for what it's looking like. Um, I'm going to angle it down just a little, just to kind of lighten this shadow up on the uh, ground plane here. Um, let's see, maybe point one. Five. Let's see, because I want that shadow to be dark. I just don't want it to be super dark. Um, 
A one, two, five, maybe. Okay. I think I like that. I think that's good. Um, so let's turn on the rim. And let me see. I think there's a way to just refresh the IPR on this. Yeah. Okay, let's select the rim, and this one is going to be coming from behind. And the reason we do this, this kind of separates the model from the background. And it's also just like a nice way to sort of highlight the silhouette a little bit better. All right, I don't think this actually worked. Um, so a lot of times you want to blow it out. Um, in Marmoset, I have it kind of blown out a little bit. Um, where is it? So the problem is like if I go to the back of the model, it's like oh, it's really bright. I'm like kind of burning this out a little bit. Um, but if I know that I only want to show it off from the front, it gives me this nice rim along the side here. Um, you know, I can go really high with that, like really highlight things. So like that might be something that you want to do. Um, but just be aware that like especially if you're doing like a 3D view like this, like you could actually really blow things out quite a bit. What? Oh, I keep typing in 3.2. Okay. And that's how you crush it. So that's another part of the demo, I guess. Uh, I'll get back to that later. Um, okay, so I want to rotate this around this way. Um, now, I think for this one, because my shadow is being cast over here, I want to actually counteract that just a little bit with this nice highlight. So uh, I don't think it's refreshing right now. So I'm going to, again, panels, render cam, IPR. Let's see here. Well, maybe it was refreshing. I just need to find the right angle. Go back to my perspective. Um, so you can see, like, even with directional lights, you can get some pretty decent results. Um, okay, rotate a little more. So yeah, you see, we're starting to get a nice highlight here. So that's like that. It's just something that sort of makes things interesting. Is to have these variations in value. Uh, you don't want everything to just be flat all the time. So I go to like. Let's just blow this way out. We'll go to like 50. Okay. So really that doesn't, you know, that's kind of nice. Uh, that's sort of an interesting look. And think about where you want the rim, you know, you want the, or the, yeah. So the one thing that I'm hitting here is that it's making, because it's directional light, any angle is blowing the heck out of the uh, ground plane. So the, the key, uh, I'm sorry, the, the rim light is the one light I want to disconnect from the ground. I only want it to affect my character. So I'm going to close this real quick. I'm going to show you light linking. So if, if say, you have, like, this one light that's, you know, it's very specific to one thing, but you don't want it to affect anything else, you can just select that light, go to uh, Windows, Relationship Editors, uh, Light Linking, go to Light Centric. It pops up this window, and this is everything in your scene. So I'm going to select my, and this is why you label everything. Again, as always, make sure you're labeling things, because when you open this, you don't want it to trial and error through this. I'm going to select my rim, and I'm going to deselect both studio and flat just by doing the regular left click. So now this rim light is not going to, it's just not going to interact with those at all. Close that, and go to my render cam, and let's open the IPR one more time. And this time we'll do the whole body. So you can see the ground now is back to normal, uh, but there's this huge blowout on here. Uh, so let's set it maybe down to like... 15. Let's see what that gives us. It's still pretty bright. Maybe 8. Um, it's pretty good. It looks, it looks alright. Um, um, yeah, I'm kind of liking, liking how this is looking. Um, so I might just leave it like that. Let's just check, though, real quick uh, what it looks like from the other camera. Because we don't want to have to redo the lighting for a different camera angle. So it's a little heavy on this rim here. So I may just rotate it back a little bit more. Um, I like that. I think that's pretty solid. Uh, let's just go back and check our frame one again. And one thing to keep in mind, too, uh, I want to see a front and back render of this character. Um, so you can keyframe the camera, but another thing you could do is actually keyframe the character itself. Um, so then maybe on frame two, 
I want to set this to zero. And now, uh, the only problem is my render cam. Let's let's make a second render cam. Call this one render cam uh, static. And this one is just going to. Let's see. Actually, I'm going to delete that because I want to duplicate it from this frame. So now, if I go from frame one to two, oh, I gotta actually look through it. Render cam static. Look through that. I go from frame one to two. I'm just getting the front and back of the character. Um, so I could just do two renders now. Let's see how this looks from the back. And this way, you keep the exact same lighting you have set up, but you just kind of. So you know, we still get that nice rim on everything. Um, and let's actually do it this way. I like this. I want to be able to see the front and back this way. So render cam. We're gonna like just kind of ignore that one for now. We're going to stick with static. We're going to actually rotate our character. And that way I can get back the rim that I liked. I liked the kind of bigger rim that I had before. So let's rotate that. Just rotating it back just a little bit just to sort of increase the, uh, <clears throat> the influence of that rim. We see so that we get this nice gradient. We have kind of three tones across here with our three lights. We have our fill or our uh, key that's kind of just doing the main bulk of the work of the illumination. We have our fill that's just kind of keeping these shadows from being too dark. Uh, and it kind of just gives a little bit of illumination from the other side. And then we have our rim, which is giving us this nice highlight. So we actually have a gradient across here. When you go from right to left, you see we have like a very, like our main value goes across here, then it starts to get dark. And then we, at the last second, we get this nice bright rim. Um, so that is how it looks with directional setup. All right, 221, so we have a little bit more time left. Um, I would like to get to Marmoset though, and I still have to do materials. So uh, let's do, I'm just going to really quickly kind of put my head down and let's set up uh, an area light. I'm going to turn this off. So let's just make sure that that actually works. Uh, if I hit render, this should be black. Yep, okay. Now, I'm going to create three area lights. And do the same thing, but with area lights. And just hit in G. I'm not duplicating, I'm hitting G to actually make three new nodes. Uh, and let's model it the same. Let's first group it. We're gonna call it area three point. So it's nice sometimes to have all these different setups in one Maya scene, so you can kind of you know, do a couple tests. And sometimes you might even want to do two beauties from the same and then kind of mix between them in Photoshop and do like a 50% uh, opacity or something like that. Um, you never know what you're going to get. Like, always want to try things. So, key, fill, and rim. So the difference with these are that, oh, and then let's also do our light linking ahead of time with our rim light. Uh, let's just go to Windows, Settings and Preferences, uh, Plugin. Oh no, what am I doing? Going on autopilot in the wrong direction. Um, relationship Editor, Light Linking, Light Centric. Uh, we're going to open our rim and then deselect these two. Just hit and save real quick. Um, all right, so let's do the same thing. We're going to take our key. I'll put that in more or less the same position. Um, but the thing to think about here is now this is not an infinite light. This is only going to cast light from this square. Uh, I'm going to scale it up. I can't remember exactly how this works. I do know that scaling actually affects uh, things like brightness. Um, but I'm just going to get it to the scale that I want, and then I'm going to kind of mess around with the brightness. But you can even scale it like in lengths and stuff. So say you wanted to do like a imitate a, um, <clears throat> let's see, imitate like a, the fluorescent lighting or something that might be in like an office building or something really ugly like that. Um, you know, you can make a nice rectangular light this way. Um, but what we're setting up is the goal is to make it not ugly. So let's start with this one just like we did before. Let's turn off the visibility of the fill in the rim. Let's look at our render cam static and I'm gonna select my key so I have my option, hit control A to have my options over here. You wanna go to the shape node. And so here we have decay. Uh, I've been calling it fall off, but decay is the same thing. 
And what this does is it makes it that, you know, it, it's more real world uh, calculation. So it's actually getting dimmer the further away from the light source that we are. Uh, whereas the directional light is just the same static uh, brightness no matter where in the entire uh, Maya 3D world that you are. Uh, so th for that means, so we're going to turn it on to quadratic. That's the closest to real world. And um, things like the thing to consider is these things vary very greatly depending on the size of your scene. Uh, so if you, you know, you might make a static lighting setup and save it and think you have a really good setup, but then you import a new model and render it and it's all blown out. Um, because like the new model is significantly smaller than the one that you use to set this up. So just be aware of that. Um, but for now, we're just working in one scene, so we'll just dial it in to get what we want. Uh, so this means we're probably going to have to uh, bump the intensity quite a bit. Um, let's just see what it is by default. Uh, again, I think the area light is when things started to kind of break down last time, so hopefully I don't get disconnected. Uh, if I do, I'll be right back. Um, yes, yeah, so we can see it's already dimmer. And let's just take a quick look. Um, so there's actually a thing where you can store your images in Maya, um, which is this, I think it's just called, yeah, keep image. So if I click this, this allows me to compare past and future, um, settings that I do. So if I set this now to no decay, you can see that it one, it's actually blowing it out big time. If I hit keep now, I can actually swap back and forth between these to compare. So this can be really useful when you're trying to dial in like a, an occlusion setting or a lighting setting. Um, IPR also does a pretty good job at that. So let's set this to quadratic. Um, try to pull it back a little bit so I can increase the brightness but create a little more contrast. Um, okay, six maybe. Yeah, it's giving me a pretty good look. Um, and this is really going to be nice on the ground, you'll see. This is a very, very dramatic look. So kind of what I was talking about doing with the spotlight, I think we're just going to skip the spotlight and do it with the area. So now with the black background, you see that like I could just, it's going to render an alpha channel, but in Photoshop, I could just make the background black, and this is going to fade right into it. So if I looked at the alpha channel right now, you'll see I do still have this line across here, but we could take care of that in Photoshop pretty easily. Um, that's looking pretty good. Let's try going up to 8. Yeah, this is fun. It gives me a weird preview sometimes, the area lights. I kind of liked the, um, the thing here too, you'll see that you don't need quite as much fill because like the, uh, the, the fall off is a little softer. So we're not getting nearly as much of a like black area as we were getting before. Uh, maybe if I rotate a little bit, it'll give me that. Uh, I think I'm going to settle on 7, though. All right, 2.30. All right, so let's just uh, close this. I'm going to set up my uh, fill and rim real quick. Uh, turn visibility on on both of them. I'm just going to kind of try to rush through this. So fill, I want about the same distance away. Maybe and I'm going to really scale this one up. I'm going to angle it up a little bit. I'm going to make sure, yeah. I want it above the plane because it actually is going to get affected by the plane here. So anything getting cast out of here is actually going to be getting uh, be a shadow, so you're not going to see it. Um, so just set this to like quadratic as well. I'm going to set this to maybe three. Let's try three. Uh, and then finally the rim. Sometimes with the rim you still might want to do directional light anyway. I'll try doing it just with this, just to have kind of a a solid uh, color or just to just to have consistency across the two um, pretty much just show you the difference between two of the exact same lighting setups so this one set to quadratic I might set this one to linear linear is a little bit less of intensity uh, it doesn't look quite as nice well depends on what you're going for but it'll just let me do like a lower value um, this will be pretty light so let's see all right save in case I crash IPR let's see what we get all right, so it's pretty flat right now. I think my rim or my fill is probably too high. Uh, let's just set this to one. Okay, that's a little bit better. Uh, rim, let's blow this out at like 20. Okay, you see we're starting to get a little bit now. Uh, let's actually set it to quadratic and see. That might give us something softer that's a little nicer. Uh, I'm gonna rotate a little bit, moving it. Make sure we get a little bit of rim on both sides. 
Who's in the center? All right. Go with 30. All right. I think it's pretty good. We have a little less contrast, I think, than our uh, other one. But I, I kind of usually like that. I like the softness. So let's save this. And now we're going to do materials real quick. Uh, I'm going to go to my beauty. Um, turn visibility in this back on for now. Um, and I'm going to have to kind of get through this quickly. Fortunately, I've already done this in the past uh, broadcast. So I'm just going to select my model. I'm going to bring it into beauty. Um, let's open the hypershade. All right, one second. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do a couple of blends. Uh, let's do, um, let's see, this is gonna be the, uh, you know what, I think I, this is gonna take a while, so I might just uh, bring in my old model with the materials on it because I covered all of this uh, in last weekend's stream, so I will put a link to that location. I'll, I'll, I'll save out a link and put it in the description of this video. Um, so let's do that real quick. I hit save. I'm just opening um, my render setup one. Um, going to delete everything except for this. Uh, only difference is I'm not going to delete the materials this time. I'm going to save this as uh, materials and open the uh, beauty render demo. I'm going to import that into here. Um, <coughs> uh, where was it? Materials. Okay, the problem is that gave me all these render layers. I'm just going to delete all them because I don't want them. Um, delete, delete. Uh, I think this one is just going to go over. So people who want to go uh, leave at three, that's totally fine. But I'm just going to kind of keep going uh, until I've covered all the stuff that I want to cover. So hopefully it'll still be a good uh, reference. Um, so mid res, let's see. I think this is the one that I imported, yeah. So let's delete this. I'm going to save this just as something else, just in case things go wrong. It's version 2. Delete that. Uh, I'm going to go to the namespace editor. You see that I have this little uh, ellip, the materials dot uh, mid res, so I want to get rid of that. Um, so I'm just going to go to the uh, Windows general editors namespace editor. That's just a namespace thing. Uh, it's just when you import stuff, Maya automatically applies like a <clears throat> an extra level it basically the name of the scene to it so I just hit and delete merge with root um, I'm not gonna get into that but just do that if you need to do this um, okay just need to move her up now and turn her around uh, let's do our keyframes on this again and set this to zero And let's see, um, I hit six. Oh, wait, I have two. Yeah, okay. Hitting six just to see if the materials are already applied or not. Okay, they are not. All right. So I want to make sure that basically everything is in my beauty layer. And then I'm just going to mess with visibility to turn my two lighting settings off and on. Add and add. Oh. Add. So uh, in occlusion though I can get rid of the actual lights. We're not going to need those. Okay. So cool. And let's turn the uh, directionals off for now. Go 
frame one. We got panels, static. Huh, where'd my backlight go? Okay. Okay, I'm static. All right, let's take a look now. I'm gonna go to beauty and open our hypershade. And I just wanna make sure that I get all of the materials applied properly. So hair, go back into here, hair, um, eyebrows. Uh, did my textures get broken? Shoot. All right, that's all right. So these three are the same. That should be um, hair scarf. Just gonna make sure my textures are mapped properly. Um, just gonna come in here. Coat to head diffuse. I could have sworn that I set more up than this. All right, well, let's see. Head diffuse gets uh, that. Head spec gets this. Um, clothing diffuse. Oh yeah, I just hadn't done the normal map and all yet. So clothing diffuse gets that. Um, all right, so I need to hit six now. Okay, so skin is, um, I don't wanna do the subsurface skin. I wanna do um, just a regular skin. Okay, and then the eyes. Okay, cool. We're in business here. And then all this stuff is its own. So I'm just shift selecting. I don't want to select the group because then it applies everything to the group and that can mess things up. I want to select each thing individually. And then this is going to be uh, material clothing. And there we go. It's looking pretty good. I'm going to leave it the ground plane. So you're going to notice she's going to be more pale in here than she was in Marmoset, and that's because I'm not doing a subsurface thing for her right now. Uh, so her texture map was pretty pale, and I still need to paint some uh, color into that, but that's, you know, that's something i got to do on my own time. Um, so coming back here, I'm just hitting save, and let's take a look at how this looks. Um, try not to break the internet here. Um, just check my settings. And I'm gonna bump my quality up, um, my gauss up. So I might disappear for a second. Here's hoping I don't. Um, if I do, I think I've actually shown everything I need to show at this point. Um, I'm gonna switch to Marmoset shortly. Um, so if I have to come back, I just might cut out the part where I actually just sit here and render these things. Um, but here we go. Let's see. I think I'm still here.